All right, so uh, I am going to attempt to tell the story about Paris death that I had promised I was going to tell. Um, it's been over a year and a half and uh, I'm just getting around to being able to, I think maybe being able to talk about this um, aside from with my counselor. Uh, so let's see how far I can get. Um, apologize for the bright light. It is because I'm sitting at the ocean because it's a happy place and there's gannets diving out there. So there's that. Okay, so um, I think that the relationship that I had with Pierre is going to have to be another story. And for right now, I'm just going to tell you about the circumstances around his passing. Um, so when Pierre was 50, he had he had a really bad sore tooth um he didn't have great teeth to begin with and um had a lot of dental issues had a really bad sore tooth and you know insurance that it is in america it is hard to go to a dentist if you are if you don't have a lot of money and so i think it was something he put off for a while and then um when he finally did go in, they did x-rays and they realized that it wasn't his tooth. It was actually back here and it was actually an, an unruptured aneurysm. So it was a, a bulging, a bulging, um, I guess, vein or I guess a bit bulging vein in his and just behind his ear, but it was affecting that painful spot. They immediately sent him to a uh, brain surgery at Stony Brook. And within days he was scheduled for surgery. Um, and the idea was that they were going to go in and um, put a coil around the, this, like, you know, like if you have a tire and it's, it hasn't popped, but it like gets this bulging bubble. It's kind of like that. So the idea was they were going to put a coil around that to hold it in and to reinforce that vein and, um, and avoid having an actual aneurysm. When, and the surgery was a success, but during that surgery, he had a stroke and, um, it, uh, it left him quite disabled for, in, in, in different ways for the rest of his life. Um, he was able to, you know, here in America, he, as a U.S. resident, but not a full citizen, um, it was really hard to get health care. It was help, you know, he was we were living he was living in Montauk. Um, it was hard to get um, transportation back and forth to the doctors that were nearly two hours away. Um, and uh, so a lot of those circumstances he couldn't work. Um, the the disability payments were basically none. And so, um, oh, there's whales out there. Uh, so, um, he ended up going back to live in Denmark. And that was in 2014 when he, no, 2013. When he went back to Denmark, his mom was still alive and, uh, she was, she had been a legal secretary for years, so she knew her way around the Danish um, help system and whatnot. She had an apartment in place for him when he got back. Um, they helped their disabled citizens much more 
than we do. And um, so he had an apartment and he was in the same apartment complex as his mom. I think they were just a floor above and below each other. And um, so that was good. He was able to then uh, start job retraining over there. He had been a, um, a very, very good car carpenter and painter um, all the time that he was in America and, um, you know, for over 20 years. So going back there and having to be retrained was a little bit humbling for him, but he, he did it and he was very proud to have gotten the course done. Um, and, uh, so then he was able to start getting jobs in Denmark with that, um, with his certification as a carpenter. Uh, he worked for different agencies. Um, and then uh, my son even actually went over and lived with him for a little while and went to school over there, uh, an international school called St. Joseph's. And um, Pierre was able to get a scholarship for him to go. So uh, it was really a, a very good experience for all of them. Jonathan lived with Pierre. Uh, that was when he would have been, uh, he would have been in eighth grade in America. They called it ninth year nine in Denmark um, because they, they do things differently in their school system. So I'm really rambling here, but anyway, um, so Jonathan was living with Pear and, and uh, so I guess he was what, 12, 13 at the time. Um, and started school in September of 2014 there. Oh, that was a whale just breached. Uh, anyway, um, so he started uh, school there in September. And by October, Bentha, who was Pear's mom, was uh, became very, very ill. And um, apparently, I guess, with stomach cancer. Pear would never actually say the word cancer. Um, I think it was too scary for him, um, but she was given very little time to live and she was also put into an hospice. Um, Pear tried to shield Jonathan from this, did not let Jonathan know that the, the gravity of the situation, um, he wanted him to continue on normally. I did not agree personally. We had talked about it. I thought that he had, he should have been a little bit more forthcoming and prepared Jonathan for the fact that his grandmother was, her death was imminent, but he did not. Uh, then, um, very early December, uh, I think it was December 3rd, um, or it could have been 10th, regardless, uh, Bentha passed away. Now, Jonathan was scheduled to come back home to America for the Christmas break and spend Christmas here and then go back to Denmark. And um, Pear's way of dealing with Bentha's death to Jonathan was unconventional. Uh, he felt that there was no need to grieve, even though um, it was apparent that, in hindsight, Pear lived in grief for the rest of his life. But at the time, Pear wanted it to be a positive thing, that Bentha was in a better place, that she was in heaven, that she was happy, she was an angel looking down on everybody, and that she wasn't really gone, she was here. I mean, these are all noble thoughts, but I think also for a young a 13 year old who was very close to his grandmother um to not to be told that he really wasn't supposed to grieve he wasn't supposed to cry um he was supposed to be happy um they had a funeral on on the sunday after she died and pierre sent him right back to school on monday um because he felt that he wanted to just continue with a normal life so, um, 
Jonathan did act out a bit. And then when he got home for Christmas, um, I think it was just so overwhelming for him. I was, I did give him a lot of sympathy. I did try and let him grieve a little bit, but it was, uh, there was a lot of conflict there. So, um, anyway, uh, he decided to stay here and, uh, Jonathan stayed here, went back to eighth grade here in United States. And of course that was a fucking disaster. He didn't get it. He didn't really fit in with the kids here and then coming back, um, from a really wonderful experience over there and back into the same kind of bully type situation, um, that he was facing here and not being accepted. And then also being in immense grief, teachers not understanding or trying to understand what a kid is going through or had been through and how much it was affecting him. Um, calling out, you know, behavioral issues as, you know, instead of understanding that the poor kid was in grief and then, you know, just accusing him of all these behavioral issues. So anyway, fast forward to You know what I'm not gonna fast forward I'm gonna just tell you a little bit more about that relationship so um, over the next couple of years Jonathan would instead of go live there he would go over there for the summer he would go over to Denmark for the summer and spend the summers with his dad um, or a good portion of the summer with his dad and um, Jonathan had always been uh, the chosen one as far as his father was concerned he could do no wrong he was literally quite literally the little prince and um his father worshiped the ground that he walked on after his stroke um the t uh, roles kind of flipped because jonathan became in some ways paris caregiver just in that uh, he recognized even at that young of an age that his father needed help. And so he became more of a helper, um, that kind of a thing. And uh, I mean, I, I give him a lot of credit. He did a really good job at that at such a young age. And um, especially dealing with all the other things. And so he went over for... Um, first summer after he got back he didn't go over because he had just gotten back for Christmas but then the second summer he went over and um you know it just what really wasn't the same without Famo grandmother there and um Pierre because he had lost his mom and he had this repressed grief or anger a lot of anger um Pierre had started to slip and for, uh, he went over when Jonathan was there for his 16th birthday. Um, the, the drinking age in Denmark is 16. So of course, Pear decided to introduce him to beer and alcohol at such a young age. Of course I was, I was, uh, furious and, um, I was extremely furious about this, knowing, um, knowing the culture in Denmark that I do now, in hindsight, now that I understand it, it wasn't as outrageous as it seemed to me at the time. Um, but it was an indicator that Pear had gone back to drinking, um, which he hadn't been with when he was after his stroke and when he was with his mom and so you know a couple of little red flags went up you know oh pears drinking again but it didn't seem it just didn't seem that bad um so then the following summer when jonathan went over you know he'd always go over with a bunch of cash that i would send with him to bring home um souvenirs or get little things that kind of thing um and uh so that year, Jonathan, I think, went over with like four or five hundred dollars. And um, 
came home with none of it and nothing to show for that several hundred dollars. Um, and it turned out that uh, Perry used that money as basically a vending machine for beer. And um, so that was an, another wild ride. Um, so that was that was a, a unfortunate situation, um, and uh, you know when I found out that that pair basically used all of Jonathan's money for drinking with the two of them, um, I was quite upset. Uh, the next year that Jonathan went over, he was. Um, 17 turning 18 and that year pear decided to uh get rid of the apartment that he had and somehow bought a boat that he worked on and the surprise was that he and jonathan were going to go live he was going he was planning on living on the boat he gave up this this great apartment he had and the intention was to live on the boat and um he and Jonathan were to take this maiden voyage and circumnavigate Zealand. Zealand is the island of Den, the, the biggest island of Denmark where Copenhagen is. It's what we all think of when we think of Denmark, we think of that island, but Denmark is also Jutland, which is goes up and around in Odense, which is another little island in between. Um, so there's, there's different, it's a, it's a bigger country than you think. Um, so the idea was they were going to circumnavigate Jutland and um, things started out kind of good. At that point, now Jonathan had always been teeny tiny. Uh, he'd also been kind of uh, mild. So he wasn't, you know, he would never have argued with his father or called him out on some of the stupid things he did. Like, you know, when Pear would go into bars, he, he tended to have arguments with people and stupid things like that. Wow, that was more than I whale. I think that might have been, oh, I think there might be a shark out there. Definitely something fast coming out of the water. Anyway, um, so, um, I guess in the fact, the fact that Jonathan had grown quite a bit that year, he was now taller than his dad. He had long hair. Uh, he was exploring his style and um, who he was a little bit. Um, Pear had some things to say about that, even though Pear had had long hair when he was younger. He didn't really like Jonathan's long hair. He didn't like his choice of colorful clothing some weird things that were unlike Pear in the past, but I think were, became to be who he was post stroke. All right. So, um, that summer, Pear and Jonathan didn't end up on good terms. Um, I had, uh, didn't realize that Jonathan's passport, his American passport had expired. Um, and his Danish one was, was not expired. So I, not knowing the law, just figured he could just use his Danish passport to come and go. And we found out while he was over there that you, a, an American citizen, a U.S. citizen cannot, you can leave the United States with a different passport, but you can't come back into the United States with another passport. You have to have your US passport to enter the United States if you're a US citizen. So he was denied to flying. His flight was denied. And um, that made the trip, extended the trip by several weeks while I scrambled here in the United States, between the United States and the fact that he didn't have a uh, an actual um, address anymore in Denmark. So there were some struggles getting that, that his American passport quickly over to him. And in the time, that time, um, 
Pear's drinking became exorbitant and he and Jonathan were arguing a lot. He was very demeaning to Jonathan and of course as the mother. Um, I, I, uh, I was angry, very angry with Pear. Um, you know, over all of our lives, we'd had, we had a, a very, very close relationship, but also um, there were issues, uh, mostly because Pear could be a very, very difficult person. Um, everybody that ever knew him knew that. So, um, suffice to say, they'd had several arguments, several issues, and um, when Jonathan came home that year, uh, he was 18, and um, they weren't on speaking terms for quite some time. I wanna say maybe even a year at least. Um, when they did reconnect, it was on a much different, uh, it was at a different level. It was much more strained. Um, and I actually would write to Pear as if I was Jonathan because I wanted them to still have a relationship despite the fact that the, the trip was so, so bad and it ended so badly. I did feel that a relationship would be able to be salvaged at some point or a new relationship would be able to be formed in a different capacity. So, um, uh, you know, I would, I would write to Pear for birthdays and uh, holidays and that kind of thing as if it was Jonathan, just, just to make sure that, you know, and I would check in on him that way too, because I knew that Pear and I, um, we, because we had gotten so angry over that, that trip, that last trip, um, our relationship was super strained. And so writing to him as if I was Jonathan was a lot easier to get the right information out of him. How are you doing? How are things? Where are you living? Where's your boat now? And, um, you know, I was able to get that kind of information out of him just because I did still care tremendously. And um, for me, I had always said that, you know, I mean, Pear was my soulmate. There's no doubt about it. Um, he suffered from mental illness and, um, and alcoholism and, you know, things that I wish could have been different. I just wish they could have been different, but they weren't. And, um, uh, so I, I, you know, as much as I wanted to be with him, I couldn't be with him because he, it was just too, too, too painful and too difficult. I was, I always said I was okay with the fact knowing that he was somewhere on earth. It was, that was the kind of thing, just knowing he was somewhere and that he was pretty much okay. You know, I didn't love that he was an alcoholic or he'd gone back to alcohol. Um, I knew that, you know, life, despite his life is beautiful bullshit, uh, I knew that life was hard for him. And, um, so checking in on him was, was just a way to comfort myself really. And, and maybe to bring him comfort and to keep some sort of a bond between him and Jonathan. And, uh, the last communication I had with him, um, we had checked back and forth Christmas time. His birthday was in January. There were, I think Jonathan actually had had an actual conversation with him back and forth at that time. And then um, in March, they touched base again. And, and then in April, I was doing some genealogy, early April 12th. Um, I was doing some genealogy and researching a little bit. And I, I, came, I felt, came up short when trying to research Pear's mom. And so I had messaged him on April 12th. And as, from, as if I was Jonathan and said, Hey dad, um, just checking in, how's everything going? And, um, just wondering if you could tell me a little bit about Famos, um, 
family history because I can't remember the exact names and whatnot. And he always used to respond pretty much right away. Whenever Jonathan would write to him, he would respond back pretty quickly. Um, it was clear that he was in some sort of a decline, but you know, I wasn't sure what that was. Um, however, okay, so that was April 12th and April 12th, he did not respond and he never responded ever again. And uh, so that I will leave as the end of this part of the story. Um, and then I'll tell you what happened after April 12th in my next video. So thanks for, uh, if you, if you were able to get through this very long 20, 25 minute video, but, um, you know, it, I'll, it'll be a book someday. Anyway, I'll let you know, I'll tell you about the death, uh, the next video.